Friday night, I shared um, some of my heart with you, and um, I want to do the same. I felt like I had more to say on the same subject, and so I'll repeat a lot of what I said um, Friday, um, but I didn't study for that. The Lord gave me something, and the same thing today. I, Eric actually asked me to uh, preach about three hours ago, and, um, and I said, sure, because God gave me something, and like Keith Green said, God gave him something. He preached it for 15 years until he gave him something new, and uh what better is a word from heaven than, uh, than 10,000 words from a man, amen? amen. We're going to start tonight with a video. Um, and the video is uh, uh, a couple clips from a, a man we would see as a general in the faith. He's now passed and went to be with Jesus. Um, but it, it shows me something. There's a heartbeat of heaven in each man. And the one that's willing to grab hold of his presence and, um, and take the full measure you can hear it in his voice. They call it anointing, uh, divine enablement, whatever you want to call it. But you know when a man's been touched by God. You know it. And I want to tell you, the generals are dying off, but they're passing the torches to other men and women that will be willing to step up and take it. Because this is our generation. If you're found here with your feet planted in this generation, it's your job to do something about it. And what your job is to do is glorify the Son of God and to have your presence, his presence found in you. And that means you're going to lose your life so that his can be found in you. Amen? Amen? And if you'll do that, he promises, if you'll die, he'll live. And if you die and he lives, that's eternal life. That's eternal life. Play the video for me, please. And I look at the whole religious scene today, and all I see are the inventions and ministries of man and flesh. It's mostly powerless. It has no impact on the world. And I see more of the world coming into the church and impacting the church rather than the church impacting the world. I see the music taking over the house of God. I see entertainment taking over the house of God. An obsession with entertainment in God's house, a hatred of correction and a hatred of reproof. Nobody wants to hear it anymore. Whatever happened to anguish in the house of God? Whatever happened to anguish in the ministry? It's a word you don't hear in this pampered age. You don't hear it. Anguish means extreme pain and distress. The emotion so stirred that it becomes painful. Acute, deeply felt inner pain because of conditions about you, in you or around you. Anguish, deep pain, deep sorrow, agony of God's heart. We've held on to our religious rhetoric and our revival talk, but we've become so passive. All true passion is born out of anguish. All true passion for Christ comes out of a baptism of anguish. You search the scripture and you'll find that when God determined to recover a ruined situation, he would share his own anguish for what God saw happening to his church and to his people. And he would find a praying man and he would take that man and literally baptize him in anguish. You find it in the book of Nehemiah. Jerusalem is in ruins. How is God going to deal with this? How is God going to restore the ruin? Now, folks, look at me. Nehemiah was not a preacher. He was a career man. But this was a praying man. And God found a man who would not just have a flash of emotion, not just some great sudden burst of concern and then let it die. He said, no, I broke down and I wept and I mourned. And I fasted. And then I began to pray night and day. Why didn't these other men, why didn't they have an answer? Why didn't God use them in restoration? Why didn't they have a word? Because there was no sign of anguish. No weeping. Not a word of prayer. It's all ruin. Does it matter to you today? Does it matter to you at all? That God's spiritual Jerusalem, the church, is now married to the world. 
that there's such a coldness sweeping the land. Closer than that, does it matter about the Jerusalem that's in our own hearts? The sign of ruin that's slowly draining spiritual power and passion, blind to lukewarmness, blind to the mixture that's creeping in. That's all the devil wants to do is get the fight out of you and kill it. So you won't labor in prayer anymore. You won't weep before God anymore. You can sit and watch television and your family go to hell. Let me ask you, is, is, is what I just said convicted you at all? There's a great difference between anguish and concern. Concern is something that you, that begins to interest you. You take an interest in a project or a cause or a concern or a need. And I want to tell you something I've learned over all my years, 50 years of preaching. If it is not born in anguish, if it has not been born by the Holy Spirit, where when you saw and heard of the ruin, and it drove you to your knees, took you down into a baptism of anguish, where you began to pray and seek God. I know now. Oh my God, do I know it. Until I'm in agony. Until I have been anguished over it. And all our projects, all our ministries, everything we do. Where are the Sunday school teachers that weep over kids they know are not hearing and they're going to hell? You see, a true prayer life begins at the place of anguish. You see, if you, you set your heart to pray, God's going to come and start sharing your heart, His heart with you. Your heart begins to cry out, Oh God, your name is being blasphemed. The Holy Spirit's being mocked. The enemy is out trying to destroy the testimony of the Lord's faithfulness and something has to be done. There's going to be no renewal, no revival, no awakening until we're willing to let Him once again break us. Folks, it's getting late and it's getting serious. Please don't tell me. Don't tell me you're concerned when you're spending hours in front of internet or television. Come on. Lord, there's some need to get this altar and confess. I am not what I was. I'm not where I'm supposed to be. God, I don't have your heart or your burden. I've been I wanted it easy. I just want to be happy. But, Lord, true joy comes. True joy comes out of anguish. There's nothing of the flesh will give you joy. I don't care how much money. I don't care what kind of new house there is. Absolutely nothing physical can give you joy. It's only what is accomplished by the Holy Spirit when you obey Him and take on His heart. Build the walls around your family. Build the walls around your own heart make you strong and impregnable against the enemy. God, that's what we desire. November 20th. Our message tonight is uh, featherweight flighters, our Holy Ghost hitters. God has called us to walk, to stand up in this generation, and to carry a load of his presence. He's built you and fashioned you in order to carry something. And guess what? It's heavy. Because we, li we live in a wicked and depraved generation that has to see one thing, and that's Jesus glorified in us. Everything else doesn't count. We were in the home meeting the other night, and the Spirit of God decided to move. That's mercy. To equip us to go out and do the works which he had called us to do. One saint of God said, when the Spirit of God touched me, I was ecstatic, I was excited, yet I was sad. Because I seen the eyes of Jesus. I seen the flames in his eyes, 
and it overwhelmed me with joy, but at the same time, I was so sad because my flesh couldn't handle it. That's Jesus. He's all-powerful, and he's all-powerful in you. Yes, he's one that'll make you tremble, and he's one that'll make you shout with joy at the same time. This is who God is, and this is who God is in you. Right now, we stand in a generation that comes against us with everything they have in wickedness, depravity, immorality, everything. And we see it everywhere. And our generation is a generation of tolerance. Tolerance breeds complacency. Instead of being prophets, we want to be professionals. You feel me? We want a career life instead of a life of faith, one that trusts him. We want an easy life. We want something that brings comfort. We want to set up and build ourselves kingdoms. When I'm telling you the truth, by experience, you build the kingdom, he's going to ask you to give it away. Because he's the king of kings and lord of lords, and he'll have it no other way for his children. I want to talk to you tonight about prayer. Prayer, a life of consecration. A life that says, I'll have you and nothing else, no matter what it takes. Lord, I want you to create in me a new heart. I want to take everything out of the old man and you replace it with you. Not make my old, old better, but something brand new. Do your creative power in me. Prayer is not a position. It's a disposition. It's not a position. It's a disposition. It's what you become. Prayer is part of who you are. This is what Paul talks about when he says, learn how to pray continuously. Pray without ceasing because your lifestyle becomes a prayer. You are a spoken word, a promise from heaven. This means that you get alone with God in your own house and you pull things from the heaven. It's made to be poured out to others. It's made to be spoken to others. Shame on you if you keep your mouth closed because you're supposed to be an open and willing vessel. Prayer is not a position. It's a disposition. It's your life. Why do I say that? I'm looking up the word prayer and I find all these things in the culture of the, uh, of the Bible and all it says is prayer is consecration. It's a way of consecration. It's a way of separating yourself unto God. What do I mean? I covered in Friday night's meeting seven points that God dropped in me and it was like, do this, 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 and this happens and all of them are relying on others. So I'm going to share those with you tonight. In Judges 6, if you would turn with me there, Judges 6, chapter 1, in Judges 6, chapter 1, we find a person named Gideon. In 1, it says, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites, because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain cliffs, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing of Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I snatched you from the power of Egypt and from the hand of your oppressors. I drove them from before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am your Lord and your, your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me, says the Lord. The angel of the Lord sat down under the oak in Oprah. That belonged to Joaz, the Ab uh, Abzurite. I'll do that. Where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, why are all, all this happening to us? Where? 
are his wonders that our fathers told us about and said, Did not the Lord bring, up, bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hand of the Midian. Uh, Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of the Midian's hands. Am I not sending you? So what happened to Gideon here? Gideon's found. The Lord sees him as a mighty warrior. Yet Gideon doesn't see himself that way. This is an answer. This is an answer to prayer. Maybe something deep down found in the heart of Gideon or maybe his parents or somebody else. But God shows up and it's up to Gideon to answer the call. But does he? And after talking and, and impressing him by the spirit of the Lord, Gideon answers the call. And where are we at that many times? At a point in our life, are we called to be professionals or, or prophets? There's, there's a point in our life where we step up and we say we're going to serve the presence of God. Are we going to serve the presence of man and our comfort and everything else in it? It's a crossing place. God comes to you and speaks. When he calls, does he call one time or does he keep calling? Yeah, he keeps calling. That's mercy. Prayer. Desperation. In my life, personally, God's never answered anything until I'm at that breaking point. I'm at that pressing point. I'm looking, I'm asking, and I'm crying out, why is this not happening? And all of a sudden, I'm into this point of frustration and breaking, and the, and the prayer gets answered. And I'm like, okay, Lord, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put you in a box, and I'm going to remanufacture this event so I can get to a breaking point quicker. And he says, you know what? It never works. He's not like that. He's smart. Beyond that's an understatement. But he brings you to this point. In Hebrews 5, 7, it says something. Let's start in 5.1. In 5.1, every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifice of sin. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. No one take this honor upon himself, but must be called by God. Just as Aaron was, so Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. You see what God did? He gave him the right to be a son, just like us. And if we're called sons and daughters of the living God, are we not in the same place, able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray, subject to weakness, to be made strong? God's bringing us to a place where we'll know what agony is, where we'll know what it is to struggle. What's he's doing here? Why is it that, that we uh, most are not present? It's because he's building something in us. He's teaching you what it is to fight. This is one of the most valuable things God will equip you with. Amen. Point one God gave me. Command. When Jesus prayed in Hebrews 5, 7. I'm going to read it to you. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Jesus did what? He prayed and offered up prayer and petitions. How many of us petition but don't pray? We have a strong petition life. You, 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 you agree with me? I need this, this, and this. Here, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I'll spend three hours before you petitioning you for this. I need healing. Amen. You're right. But doesn't your father know your needs and will he not meet them? You see, prayer and petition are two different things. 
Yes, petition him. Jesus did it. But pray also. And when you pray, you get alone with him. You get alone with him and you wrestle just like Jacob did. Just like Jacob. My personal conviction is that in, the, that in our prayer closet is where we fight and we learn to fight. And when we're out in the world, it's where we're victorious and we win. You go to your prayer closet to fight and you go to the world to win. That's the outcome. You spend time with God. You get along with him like Jacob and you say, I will not leave you until you bless me. I will take hold of you. I will not move from this spot until I hear your name, until I feel your presence. Give me what I need. This is a petition. And prayer says, I want to know who you are. I want to see your face. I want to see the fire. Not because I need something, because I need to know you. I need to know you. A desperation starts to cry out. Something starts to grow in you that you are here and he is there and you must connect the two. It's a vital desperation, an agony, a grieving. Doesn't scripture not say that the creation is subject to frustration? Waiting for the revelations of the son of God. The sons of God to stand up, waiting for us to step up and step into the right place of ownership, of inheritance of the saints to be fulfilled through us so that he may be glorified in us, to die so that he would live in us. And what does this mean when you pray, when you get that close to the fire? Guess what? It's going to it's going to shake your world. It's going to stir your nest. The reason the spirit of God comes on somebody and you're ecstatic and you're excited and joy overwhelms you, yet you still get the feeling that woe is me. It's because he's a mighty God. He's he's oh, this, what words explain him. I don't know what to say. Command. Hebrews 5, 7 commands us to pray in petition. Why? When you pray in petition brings you into a lifestyle of prayer or consecration. A setting apart of that says, I'm not a part of them, but I'm a part of him. So that you can affect them for him. Consecration and not not just a, a taking away from the world to be apart from them and treat them like there's something else. No, Jesus died for them. He is their Lord and Savior, too. They just hadn't realized it yet. Consecration. What's consecration bring? Conflict. Everybody struggles in why. Answering the question why. Why is there conflict? I'm going to tell you the ones who have the strongest prayer life probably had the strongest conflict but they have the strongest uh, victory rate as well. You see, you're not scared to get along with God because you love him and you trust him. And you know that struggling with him is going to end up with victories in the world. But if you're not struggling with him, you're going to struggle in the world and you're not going to win. You're going to get along with him and he's going to show you what it is to fight. And then when you apply it out there, the devil can't stand up to that. He's meant to equip you. And he has called you to win. Amen. Conflict. Conflict is the evidence of things unseen. When you pray, you're asking for conflict. When you pray, you're asking for conflict because conflict in the end produces life in you. Oh, I die daily, our Christian language. Guess what? Conflict kills you. It kills the flesh. It puts it to death, and that's what you want. That's what you signed up for. <laughs> it brings joy. Why? How does it bring joy? See, in the mind of faith and understanding that trials bring life in the end, and you signed up for this, with this right perspective, it's, 
Well, I know what you know what I'm talking about because we, we say it all the time, you know, send the fire, right? Okay, I'm not talking, we're all family here. Y'all understand? Amen. Conflict. I love what conflict does. It brings you to a consciousness. It brings you to a consciousness of his presence around you, of the kingdom within you. All of a sudden, you become aware of things unseen, things that you haven't seen before. Why? Because you've been alone with God and he's made your, uh, your mind right. Your mind, your will, and your emotions are all subject to him. And now you've got the right perspective, the prescribed order from the heavens. Matthew 5, 6. Bless, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For what? They will be filled with what? They will be filled with the concentrated version of his presence. So tangible, so potent, so grips your soul that you understand when you go out what it is to grieve for the lost, to grab hold of somebody because 150,000 people a day are going to hell. You can't act right. You can't walk right. You can't do your job right because you're so gripped from heaven. This is what it is to have an agony and a passion for his presence. Consciousness. You, does that sound like it's dangerous sometimes? It can be. It'll shake your world. But you know what? That's what Jesus came for. So that you don't leave the same. So tomorrow you're not the same as you were today. That's encouragement to me. Ah, where it brings you next is communion. We say this word all the time, but do we know what it is? Communion, common, commonality. Commonality with the Holy Ghost. You got the Holy Spirit living in you, and there should not be two clashing kingdoms. It should be one submission to the Holy Ghost, and all of a sudden, your actions, your righteousness are common. Your new nature. Thank you. This is when you stop doing because you know it's right to do, but you find yourself doing because your nature has changed. You're following me? Yeah. You automatically do righteousness. You automatically do right because you have been inhabited by the Holy Ghost and he has full submission over you. No longer is it the battle. The tide has turned. It's turned. Now you're walking in the new nature of life. This is what communion is. We call it at one with or atonement. He made at one with him or atonement. It is to remain in him as he remains in you. This is the place when you're in this place, this communion. This is the place where you choose or choose not to answer the call. Look at me. Uh, look at uh, Hosea 11. Hosea 11.1, 1. when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. But the more I called Israel, the further they went from me. Do you feel like that sometimes? Do you see that sometimes? A while ago, with some, some of your mouths, you, you said, the call is not a call, but he keeps calling. And each time he calls, it's an opportunity to follow his voice. It's an opportunity to follow after him in the calling, day after day after day. Or yet you can be an obstinate child. You can be one that calls, you go further and further away. Or you can dwell into his presence and fulfill the call of your life. What are we going to do? It's a measure for a measure. Faith upon faith. We walk in him each 
day. And he calls every day. Every day. We don't want to be like Israel. That went further and further away from him each time he calls. That's a running away. Running away. You know what running away looks like? Trying to get comfortable. Trying to build for yourself uh, things that cause you to be protected. Well, he's only called you to trust him. Trust him. Because you know what? If you'll trust him, if you'll take that free fall, you'll find that he catches you every time. And then you'll know who he is. But see, if you don't, you don't know that because you don't get along with him, you don't struggle with him, then you struggle out in the world and the world lies to you. But if you get along with him and you know what it is to pray, you know what it is to press in and struggle, and you know what it is to grieve in agony before him, you'll see. You'll see what it is for your family members to get saved. You'll see what it is for sicknesses that have uh, been dwelling for years to be broken in the name of Jesus. You'll see what it is to carry what they call the anointing on you. The Holy Ghost will overcome, in you, overcome you and do things that you cannot do. And you'll walk away and say, what happened? It's supernatural. You can't explain it. It's Jesus. When you can't explain it, it's Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right. <laughs> then you answer that call. If you don't run away every time he calls, but then you run into his arms every time he calls, then you can say we're in covenant. We're in an intimate place with one another where you say yes before you know the question. Where when he calls, you jump. This is covenant. This says I trust you. I love you. If you love me, you will do my commandments. It didn't say if you do my commandments, you'll love me. Whether you love me or you'll do my commandments. There's a place he wants you to come to. There's a place in heart. We always talk about the prayer closet and things like that. And everybody's thinking that when I say go home and pray. But I want to tell you the prayer closet's not there. It's in here. The prayer closet's in here. They're represented in Israel when they wore a tallit. And they could stop, drop, and pray at any time. And they cover their head because they knew right here was the presence of God. And he wrapped his wings around them. Amen. I want to tell you, Jesus broke the veil and the tallit. It's his covering of his presence over you. And at any time that you call out upon his name, you'll find his presence dwelling in you Amen. to do his work. Amen. When everything is creeping around you, coming around you, when sickness is trying to come over you, you stop, drop, drop and pray. And you'll find the sickness, darkness and everything else cannot dwell in the presence of the most high God. Amen. Covenant. When you're in covenant, you'll know it because there'll be something supernatural that happens. There'll be a desire birth. And I'm going to tell you, you can't make desire. But I've tried and tried and tried. And I said, Lord, I need that desire. I'm going to go get it. I figure out how to make it. It just it's supernatural. It's like an impregnation. It's like an overshadowing of the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden you find in you a promise that's getting bigger and bigger and coming to a point where it's pain and travail, and everything in you. And at that point, at that point where it's the hardest, and it, feel like, it feels like hell is against you, that's when the birth pains are happening and something beautiful is about to be birthed. Amen? Amen. Amen. This is what it is to be overshadowed and uh, carry the heavy kavod or the presence of, of God. See, this is what I'm trying to tell you tonight. I'm trying to tell you that you were built with broad shoulders to carry the heavy presence of God. You are not a featherweight fighter. Did you notice I named this featherweight fighters? You know why? Because if you found to be a featherweight not carrying the heavy presence of God, you're not a fighter at all. You're a flighter. You're running. And we don't run. We haven't been given the spirit of timidity, but of power. Amen. The Lord God sent us to have demonstration of power, not elegant, elegant words, but a demonstration of power to glorify his name, to manifest his glory through us. Amen. This is what it is to be found in him. This is what it is to be a 3D prayer closet. You got me? You go get alone with the Lord. Yes, I'm telling you, it's not about hours. It's about how you pray. It's about how you talk to your God. Who is he? I'm telling you, you can tell the measure of a, of, of a godly man by how much he sp time he spends with the Lord, not because it's uh, checking off a quota, because he wants to. 
because he wants to. He can't wait to get off of work because i got to spend time with my God, my Jesus. This is my daddy. It's the one who I love. I don't want to be a professional because I, I need to be a, uh, someone who prophesies. You know what prophesies is? It's tell, to foretell the word of God. Not foretell, foretell. That means to let your mouth have his word in it and you speak it. And if that brings you persecution, if that brings you trial, tribulation, praise God because you have been called blessed. Amen. Amen. This is who we are. This is what we signed up for. And there's no quit in us. There's no quit in us. If you find quit in you, you can cast down that voice because it's not the voice of the most high God. It's the voice of the flesh and the flesh should be put under your foot. Genesis 30, don't turn there. Genesis 30. What did Rachel say? You remember the story? Rachel wanted to have babies. That's the only thing she wanted to do. She wanted to have babies and all the midwives, all, midwives, all the, tell me about, yeah, those ladies, all those women were, were birthing her promise. All of them. All around. They were giving birth to the only thing she desired. And again and again and again, she had to watch somebody go through the only things she desired, the only things that she wanted in life. To a point, it came to a point where she cried out, give me children or I'll die. You see, this is the heart of God. This is what it is to pray without ceasing. This is what it is to travail, to see the victory of God in your life, to see things come about, to see. You remember what I said? I didn't believe God answered prayer. I believe he answered desperation. He wants to get you to a point, not because he's trying to be hard on you, because he's trying to make you like him. You see, he's a jealous God. He's a jealous God, and he wants you to be jealous for righteousness, Amen. for the cause of Christ. What is it that stirs this in me? It's because I don't see righteousness displayed everywhere I go. It's a problem. It's a problem for me when I step into a, uh, to an atmosphere and righteous is not prevalent. Righteousness is not what everybody desires when I desire I love everyone in here because we have the like mind to see righteousness prevail. But you know that when we walk out of this door, we will not see it. Unless one man or one woman steps up and preaches the word of God. Because how will they hear if you don't preach? How will they know? By the foolishness of preaching, God chose to display his message through us, through us. Are we, are we scared? Are we scared or are we so consumed by the Holy Ghost, consumed by the fire that we cannot help but speak about the one we love, about the one who paid the price for us, Amen. about the one who shed his blood for us, about the one who lives in us, He's a consuming fire, and if you let him burn, you can't help it. You'll create a forest fire. And where does this bring us to? Community. Community. You see, God's ultimate goal is always an inward expression, an inward presence to be an outward expression. Why? Because if you will get along with him and you will grieve before him, before the Lord, if you'll know what it is to have groans that liberate the creation, that becomes attractive to the Holy Ghost. You become the one that he wants to inhabit. You become the one that he wants to burn in, to consume, because you'll say, yes, Lord, to whatever it is. Right. Remember I said we were in control of this generation? God's given us this. What kind of men and women say, 
We dedicate our children to you and mean it. Well, I'll tell you what kind of Christians. You know why? Because God showed us. God said, give up my, my son in order that I be glorified. What does that say to me? It says, I'm going to dedicate my children to God first. And so in their mind as they grow up, they're going to know that he said go. They're going to know that he said go. And so we're going to prepare them with the mind of, on the mission field. And if they stay, it's because the Lord said stay. They're not going to have to hear that he said go. They're going to know he said go first. And the Lord said stay. That's the only way they're going to stay. Other than that, I'm going to be like my God and I'm going to give up my son for the greater benefit of the world. I'm going to give up my daughters for the greater benefit of the world. Because when I look into the word and when I press into his, his spirit, he says, I done this. So you do this. Community. Leonard Ravenhill quoted uh, somebody too old for me to remember. And he said, you know what? What a community of God is. God is not building a social network of people. He's building a fire. And his quote was that there's no need to advertise a fire. You see, this is what God does with the community. He burns in you and he burns in you, 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 all of you. And when you collectively come together, we become the pillar of fire. We become the pillar of fire before God and we burn for the whole nation to see. And because we burn, people come running. They are attracted to you. And see, the, the ones that want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, the ones who want to know his name, the ones who want to know who they are because they got a void in them that they cannot feel. These are the ones that are attracted. And all of a sudden, because you set yourself on fire and let yourself burn, the sons and daughters of the living God rise up and they come and they collect around you and no longer are we sporadic fire but we're one holy pillar to him this is what God does and this is why he doesn't have to advertise a fire because when somebody sets a fire people come running so what is it who are we are we going to be a consecrated group of people that call upon his name and burn for his name burn for his reputation a nameless, faceless tribe that has no reputation. But to see him glorified and made famous on this earth. It starts here. Let me tell you about the heartbeat of God. You know what excites me tonight to be able to share something like this with you? Is that I'm not your pastor. I'm one of you. You get me? I'm going to break down a wall of... Uh, of whatever we got in our minds of, of some sage on the stage. I am your brother in Christ. You got me? I have no title. That's nice. Let me tell you, it's liberating. Because you can know that most of the time I'm in that seat with you. We have the key to God's heart. We have the key to his presence and we have we can grab hold to the heartbeat of God. We can see flu break in the name of Jesus. Amen. We can see uh, the overcoming power of in every situation break. Our pastor Eric's not here tonight, so I can say something about him. He's not my pastor because he works hard for the kingdom because he knows the word of God. He's my pastor because when I look into his eyes, I see tired eyes. And you know why? Because he travails in the presence of God, in the spirit of God. Because he's wearing himself out for the kingdom. And I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about in his heart. There's something that beats there, beats and beats. And that's the heart of God. Because he wants to see each and every person in here walking to the full potential that God called them to. And he gets so grieved when somebody falls in sin 
because it's not for you. That's the old man and not the new. You see the heart of this place and the heart of everybody sits in here is that same thing. As I grow old, I pray. I pray that I have humble eyes. I pray that you can see written on my face that God makes me a shepherd to lay my life down for others. That's what I pray when I get along with God. When I get along with God, I say, take everything out of me and give me a heart for other people. Teach me what it is to die daily so they can live. And I, I want to wear humble eyes. I want to because that's the presence of God on your face. When you can when God so transforms your heart that you can see it on your face, you can see each and everything written on a person's face. And if you can see the travail and the agony of God on a man's face, that means he's been touched by God. Somebody in here wants to be touched by God. Somebody wants to know what it is to go deeper with him. I do. And I know each and every one of you. I know. All we need to know is how. How. But you don't know how until you get face to face with him. Face to face with him. And you can. You see, that's why Jesus died. To give you the full inheritance, to break away into the Holy of Holies. It's for you. When are we going to get an agony like the man was talking about? For righteousness, for the cause of Christ. Because if you'll stand up for the things that God cares about, he'll create in you a new heart. He'll create in you a new spirit. Now, I'm not talking about you don't have one now. I'm talking about even more and even better. You see, you've been walking with, with the Lord for 5, 10, 20, 30 years, and you think that, uh, that you're somewhere. But no, with the Lord, you're never somewhere because he's always deeper. Deep cries out the deep, and that scripture is always true. I don't care if you've been walking with him for three years or 300 years. That scripture is always true. That means when you find the deep spot of God, there's always more. There's always more with him. And who's it for? Yeah, you. Come on, that's encouraging. Yeah. Is that encouraging? Yeah. Groaning. You know what? Do you feel a, a burden on me? Yeah. Yeah. And each and every one of you should have a burden your own self. It's there. And if you'll step up to the call of God that he's called you to today and step into that and trust him with it, he'll birth something new in you. He'll birth something that's old in you and it should have been, should have been already a reality. And he'll teach you what it is to pray and overcome. Petition and overcome. Jesus, when on the earth, the example to us, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and groanings. Yeah. Want to be like Jesus? Yes. Then get the heart of heaven. Get the heart of heaven. This is what I'm encourage you with tonight. You are not a featherweight people. You did not step into the ring with a featherweight fighter. Your opponent is a heavyweight. But God called you to be more than overcomers. And that means you're an overcomer of the heavyweight opponent. You are a Holy Ghost heavyweight. Because of the presence of God in you, because of the kavad that is upon your shoulders, if you will accept it, God will show you what it is to be heavy burden for him, which is liberating and actually gives you life. We're praying tonight and we're in worship and we're praying. But there comes a time where you go from English to tongues. All right. And then we usually stop there. But I'm going to tell you, there goes a time where you go from English to tongues to groanings in his presence. Groanings that liberate. Uh, uh, agony of heart. But we don't know what that is until we get along with him and we pray without ceasing. 
We pray until we see others saved. We pray until we see the sick healed, until we see demonic strongholds cast down. You see, God's trying to build that in you. Some things come out with much prayer. And this is what Jesus was talking about because he wants you to be a Holy Ghost heavyweight. It's the best I can say it. Sounds corny, but you get the point. Right. Amen. Amen? You want to play something? Yeah. So with that said, my goal to you is in your perspective, when you close your eyes, you should see the fire of God. You should see into the heavens because Jesus is there and you are connected like an umbilical cord. And the reason is, is because he wants you to get something from him, a nourishment that nourishes others. He wants to teach you what it is to fight. And with everything in us here, everything with I'm talking about us, my brothers and my sisters, everything in us. As long as I'm here, as long as my brothers are here, we're going to teach each other how to fight. We're going to teach each other how to fight and to overcome, how to walk in a victory and how to see others do it as well. This is the heart of God. Amen. Amen. Miss Susan, turn to or pull up Luke 18, verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always do what? And not. There's lots of things to walk away with Mike's message. It was a wonderful word. It actually encompassed about four different conversations with four different people that I had today. Right, Curtis? In fact, Curtis and I were speaking about tongues and when to use tongues and uh, how do you know that, uh, you, you know, it precisely when to use it. Is it all the time? Is it just during prayer? Is it just during worship? But Curtis and I have coined a phrase now that I want to share with you guys. So Susan, also pull up uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Now this is known as the, the chapter of love, right? But check this out. He said, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. You know there's two different kind of languages that exist within the universe? There's the languages of men, which God separated at the Tower of Babel, but also there's an angelic language, right? The language of men can be powerful, can be poetic, can be moving and stirring. But you know that the, the language of angels is something that's on an entirely different realm. Whenever we were praying tonight, there came a certain point when we weren't just praying in the language of men, whether it be English uh, Serbian, Spanish, but we were praying in the language of angels. There's a switch that goes off, and you are no longer just speaking to the sickness itself, but you are speaking to the heavenly realms to be moved. Every single person in this room has the authority and the access by the living God and by the blood of Jesus to rock the heavenly realms, to command angels to do the will of God. So the phrase that Curtis and I have coined is that you look the devil at that sickness in the face and you tell them, don't make me go angelic on you. That's that next notch up. Mike built a good word, and he's right in quoting Keith Green. I'm preaching the same message because God has not given me anything else. This is something that he's birthed from his own life. And what I'm going to take away from it, for me personally, what I see right now as the need of our church, is that I'm going to consecrate myself before the living God. I'm going to pick a fight with prayer. And I'm going to watch the covenant of the living God rise inside of me to the point it brings ichad, unity, and community with the body of Christ so that the works of the devil will be destroyed. Larissa, 
You are called by God to destroy the works of the devil because Jesus wants to do it through you. He wants to kick his rear end with a butter knife. He wants to beat him to death with a spoon. And that's us. So let's stand to our feet.